Hello, today. Blah. Rewind that. Burp. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 4, 2018. And this is the weekend charts. Thanks for sharing that, Donald, because I actually was going to talk about that in a minute. And I'm glad somebody actually shared that with me. Donald said he, he dropped a few F bombs this week. <laughs> so did I, as you'll soon see. First and foremost, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and I'm humbled by your presence. So thank you so much. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, trick or treat, welcome to October, benefit of the doubt or cause for concern. I've been a little worried about this market here and there lately, but I've been giving it the benefit of the doubt. And then you have a day like yesterday where things are looking a little bit better, but then bonds begin to look pretty questionable. And we're going to break all that down when we get to the live charts. Obviously, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep the questions and comments mostly to what's on the slide or keep them to what's on the slides just so my ADD doesn't take off on me. And then when we get to the live charts, you can ask any other questions. Or towards the end of the presentation, I should say, you can ask any other, press, uh, any other questions. And when we get to the live charts, you can also begin asking about your favorite stock picks. The only thing I ask is, and this is for your benefit, just ask about one stock at a time. That way I know which ones I covered and which ones I didn't. So what's today's focus? Well, today's focus is on being cognizant, and I'm going to flesh that out in a tremendous amount of detail the next few minutes, or maybe even a little longer. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen now and then. Today is Exhibit A on that. I often say that there's no secret to trading. And then I get buried in working on presentations and then begin to think maybe there is a secret to trading. Well, the secret isn't some gee whiz, get rich quick BS that fills your inbox on a day-to-day -day basis. It's little simple things like embracing your emotions and recognizing when you may be tempted to do the wrong thing and are not doing the right thing and possibly becoming emotionally charged. And that could pretty much be summed up into being cognizant. And this is something that I've been really feeling a lot lately and burying myself into putting out this learning management system and rolling it out, I should say. And paying attention as I'm working on the, the trading psychology, which keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Everybody's a setup junkie and everybody wants to know about methodology. So obviously there's a lot of setups and methodology and all, and that's covered in a lot of detail. And also you're going to need money management as I often preach because the best methodology in the world is useless without money management. Well, the best methodology in the world is also useless, and this is why I talk about the holistic trader and approaching trading holistically, but the best methodology is worthless without the proper mindset to follow that. And in studying neurology and studying psychology, in a lot of cases, it could all be boiled down to just being cognizant of your own feelings and how your own feelings could be a microcosm of other people out there, or maybe possibly put it another way that everybody is emotional and maybe a little crazy, just like you are. Now, in putting together this presentation, what I've been doing lately is going through all the presentations I did a year or so ago. Instead of reinventing the wheel, just go in and see what I did back then see what needs to be part of the learning management system. And today in going through everything, I found a webinar that I did about being cognizant. And what was kind of interesting is this was well over a year ago or a year and a month or so ago, I should say, when I first did this webinar on being cognizant. And to my surprise, those same things are just as relevant today so just last year and i don't remember when it was or what i mentally monetized open profits and guess what last week and the week before i did the same thing a couple of weeks ago i did 
a presentation where I said that, long story endless, I said that I was up a couple points on a stock. I had just put on a trade the night before, come in the next day, I'm up a couple bucks, feeling pretty smart, going for breakfast, have a little tiff with my wife, and think to myself, well, you know what? I'm pretty smart. I'm making money. So no matter what goes wrong in the world today, I'm still smart and making money. Felt pretty good. As I'm walking back to my office, I'm thinking, you know what? I think I might lock in that profits to show how smart I am. And guess what? Well, by the time I got back to my office, that profit had already eroded. Now, there's two problems there. One, I was going to violate my plan for a reason that had nothing to do with the markets. And that's part of today's underlying theme in addition to getting, being cognizant of your own emotions, just realizing that a lot of things that happen in the market have nothing to do with logic, but more importantly, they have to do with the emotions of the market participants and the emotionally charged decisions they make that often have nothing whatsoever to do with trading. And just last year, I found myself thinking this was easy, but just briefly, well, just yesterday, I found myself, or day before yesterday, I found myself thinking this is easily easy, but just briefly. Now, there's reasons for that, as we'll dig into a little bit, and we've gotten into deeper in the past. But the reason that you don't feel like it's easy for long is more often than not, markets are going get against you. And the second more important reason that you really have to be cognizant of or wrap your head around uh, is that a negative observation is going to have twice the emotional response at least than a positive observation. Just last year, I took profits and thought, if this thing keeps on going, I'm only going to have a half position. And this also happened last week, ironically. The stock didn't begin to come back in, and I thought, geez, maybe that was the top. I really don't feel like giving up open profits for a scratch. Well, that's also today. <laughs> it had also happened a few days ago. So let's take a look at this chart. I had a limit order. I know you're probably thinking, D, what are you doing limit order? Well, settle down, Beavis. I guess that makes me butthead, but... <laughs> I had a limit order in to sell half of my position at 24. Well, in general, I don't believe in limit orders except in a few cases, except in one case, I should say, when you're looking to take partial profits. Now, I know I preach set an alarm and then take action, but I was, I've been really busy lately working on this learning management system, and I just want to let the market make as many decisions for me as possible so I can stay focused on the project, and then truth be told, so I'm not micromanaging and doing all these other things that I preach against. Just because I decided to become a trader doesn't mean that I don't still have a lot of emotions. Doesn't mean that I'm still not a human being. As I've mentioned recently, I've been proofing Linda Rasky's book, which is fantastic, by the way, and I will recommend it and put a link on my website as soon as it's available. There is no title just yet. It is a working title that she's thinking about. Anyway, long story endless, and going through it, it really made me feel normal. I saw all the ups and downs and emotions that she had as over her long career as a very accomplished trader, and it made me feel very normal to have those similar type of emotions. Anyway, so I noticed my limit order was hit. I felt Pretty good about that. A few minutes later, the stock begins to come back in. And I'm like, oh, boy, I'm glad I took initial profits. And then it stopped to get a take off. And then I found myself thinking, damn it, if I would have hung on to that position a little longer, I'd have a lot more money in my account. So this is what it looks like on a micro level. So as you can see here, this is where I took profits almost at the exact top, at least at the moment. Then it starts coming back in. Now, as it starts coming back in, what am I thinking? Oh, man, if I'd have sold all my shares, I wouldn't be losing that additional money. And then a few minutes later, what happens? The stock begins to take off. 
and then it begins to implode. So I went back to thinking, wow, this, wow, it'd be great if I had those shares on. And then I went into, oh, goodness, I still have those shares on. So you have to be really careful to be a little antiseptic and a little detached and agnostic when it comes to following the plan and be very careful with the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. Now, my intention in showing you that was not necessarily the negative observations, but it's kind of, it's in the back of my head now. It's like, here was a positive event. I took profits on a trade, and if I scratch out on a remainder, so what? I know, haha, so what? But here overall is a positive thing. It's a positive thing to take profits. It's a positive thing to add some money to your account to lock in those profits, right? Provided, of course, you're following the plan. But it turned into a bit of a negative for me because I was making too many observations. Just last week and yesterday and today and this morning, a little while ago, I dropped a few F-bombs. One of the things I've been thinking about for a long time, I haven't done it, is to just count the number of F-bombs I drop every day <laughs> and see if over time that begins to deteriorate. That's the other thing in Linda's book. It's like she drops a lot of F-bombs. It's like, well, I think nearly every trade I've ever met does that. Not that I'm proud of that. It's just it is what it is. But being cognizant of your emotions is very important. I've often talked about the importance of keeping an emotional journal. I haven't kept one lately, but I probably should. Years ago, I would look back at notebooks and see how emotional I was. And it made me think, wow, I'm still emotional, but I'm not as bad as I used to be in all this. And by the way, you cannot escape emotions. It's part of our physical makeup. And we might skirt upon that in a few minutes, as we've done before. But I think it's important to be cognizant of your emotions. And as I said last year, I dropped a few F-bombs and so did a client. Well, as we were going live today, I think it was Donald. Yeah, Donald said, well, speaking of F-bombs, I just dropped some F-bombs. Well, okay, so now that, that slide is relevant today or as irrelevant today as it was a year ago. So just last year, and then last week, this is kind of the state of regret thing I was kind of talking about, I found myself in a state of regret for positions not working at worst. I was also concerned that this could be the start of something bigger. Well, I had a little bit of those concerns yesterday, and I almost just said, pardon my back, I forget I'm not on camera. But I'm looking over to my trading station, and I see that half of my positions are going against me today, and the market looks a little bit ugly. And we'll get into that ugliness of the market in just one second. So once again, I'm having a little bit of emotional concerns that this could be the start of something bigger. Now, just last year, and maybe soon, I am going to question the sanity of doing the same thing for a third time in a row, expecting a different outcome. Albert Einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. As mentioned before, I don't believe in day trading. I don't believe in intraday charts, with the exception of in an efficient market such as Forex, there's some hourly trading that you can do. And it's a little bit on the tough side to do this because you will get stopped out quite a few times. And I got stopped out just yesterday, and now I'm questioning whether or not I'm crazy for going after the market a third time. But sometimes that third time's a charm. I, I don't want to digress too far, but I'm just pointing and throwing it out there, something a little bit different from what I normally do or do the most of. Okay, it's not necessarily bread and butter type of training. It's just something that I do on the side a little bit. Just to point out, there's different emotions evolve with different type of trading, and you will question your sanity and your trading. Just last week and last year, I found myself staring at a screen 
when I really didn't need to. All right, this is my current trading station that I have set up over here. I had a second office set up as I discussed previously when I was taking care of my mom, and this is this big screen over here. I've got a, a small little powerful computer on the back of this screen just to keep it kind of portable. This is a stand-up desk. Well, I did a stand-up, it's a fixed stand-up desk, and I used a fixed stand-up desk just because I didn't want to bring a lot of equipment into my sister's house, but I still needed a big screen to work off of. Well, when I moved it back into my office here, I decided that it was going to be my trading station, and I kind of liked the fact that it was a fixed stand-up desk. This desk over here that I'm working on now, I'm actually standing now, but this is also a stand-up desk, but I do find myself sitting way more than I need to. The point is, and I do have one, with the fixed stand-up desk, it forces me to stand up to place a trade, which means that I'm physically in a better place to place that trade as opposed to being in a low energy, sitting, slouching type of state. But more importantly, as I've learned, it makes me cognizant of when, when I'm watching the screen unnecessarily. So if I'm standing, literally standing in front of this monitor, after a few minutes, I begin feeling like, wow, I'm getting kind of tired just standing here. And it's like, why are you standing here? It makes me question that. And I was like, well, because I'm watching the screen. Well, why are you watching the screen? Well, because I'm watching things go up and down. Do you need to watch the screen? No. Set a stop. Move on with your life. In certain cases, as I said earlier, maybe a limit order. So the whole point here is you need to be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. And getting back to being cognizant, you have to embrace and accept your feelings and emotions. And you have to understand that we have this little panic monster inside of us that urges us to take action. Inaction is not in our emotional makeup. And I'm reading some of these behavioral finance books. I go back and forth on whether or not <laughs> to get excited about these behavioral finance books because they all kind of sound the same. It all goes back to, I don't want to butcher the names, but uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, Amos and Daniel, it's like Daniel Kennerman and Amos Tversky. Anyway, long story endless, one of the books I'm reading now talks a lot about our ability to or our propensity, I should say, to take action and how even in life, a lot of times taking action is rewarded, even though a lot of times no action should be taken. And the reason we take action is because it's this little thing in, inside our brain called the amygdala. And many years ago, taking action a lot of times was very, very necessary. If you heard some leaves rustle or a little shadow in the bushes or whatever, you better run first and ask questions later. You better take some action. However, in the markets, a lot of times there's nothing to do, even when those positions are going against you. If you get out every time you have an adverse move, which, as I preach, you're, more often than not, you will have an adverse move against you, depending on the number of observations you make. And the more observations you make, the more likely the market will move against you, even on profitable positions. But letting that emotional part of your brain take charge, as opposed to the rest of what's sloshing around up there, could get you in a lot of trouble. So you have to be cognizant when you're waking that panic monster, when you're in a state of panic and emotionally charged decisions. Now, I've talked about this quite often, just real quick. Dr. Robert Marr wrote about the Kaizen way. It's how taking small steps can change your life. Now, I don't want to come across as an expert on this because I've had my own trials and tribulations. 
but I'm not as extreme as some friends of mine. I have several friends, and I'm not pointing to anyone in particular, but more of a collective of them, who have gone on a lot of fad diets. And they lose a lot of weight, and they stop eating, stop drinking. They're not much fun to hang around with, by the way, when they're doing that. And then what happens is after making such a drastic change, their brain fights it, and they fall back into their old habits really quickly, except that it becomes even worse, as opposed to making a lifestyle change for a longer-term health and so forth. And in his book, he talks about making very, very, very small trains, kind of, uh, I'm sorry, in his book, he talks about making very, very small changes to where you kind of bypass that panic monster, bypass that amygdala. And one example he uses is this overweight woman went to a lot of doctors and they put her on all these diets and made her want to do all this vigorous exercise and all these crazy things. Never worked, never worked, never worked. And she went to Dr. Robert Meyer and he says, well, why don't you just tonight when you watch TV during one of the commercials, just one of the commercials, stand up and march as silly as it sounds for one minute. Well, she started doing that for one commercial, then two commercials, then all commercials. And paraphrasing the book, she kind of worked into more and more and more of this. And before you know it, she was she was into the rigorous exercise and didn't have the big pushback from her brain because she was able to bypass those more primal, primitive, emotional parts of the brain. So in trading, you can make small changes to do that and on a on a minute level when you do find yourself not following a plan or going to make that emotional decision let me rewind in a minute all decisions are emotional but when you feel like you're going to make that emotionally charged decision sometimes it's just as simple as counting to three as i often say the next time you find yourself getting ready to have an emotional Reaction to your spouse or significant other, and by the way, who am I to judge? But if you have both, it's probably going to be hard for you to trade <laughs> in addition to juggling that. I guess that joke's getting a little old, huh? But the next time you want to snap back, okay, count to three. You're welcome. And if you do count to three, and if you have an experience with this, let me know. But when, not all the time, but when I count to three, I get that little Terminator thing in my brain happening, you know? F you, no deer, uh, you know, you pick one of the above, you know, in your head. <laughs> it's, as I often say, I tell this to my wife that, that explain, you know, the neurology and stuff and blah, blah, blah. And it's pretty exciting to live with me, I have to admit. Uh <laughs> And I say, yeah, well, like one of the things is amygdala and blah, 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 and you count to three. And she's like, you do that? I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, counting to three? Oh, baby, you have no idea how many situations I've only, since I've learned about these things, that I have not snapped back. Not that I'm perfect, and I snap back quite often. Anyway, just last year and a month ago, I found myself in a trade that I didn't fully plan ahead of time and was, wonder, and was wondering what to do with it while it was still moving against me. I think I mentioned recently it's setting up this new trading station that I've been working off of lately. I happened to, by coincidence, I happened to open up a new account with a new brokerage and kind of a long story, but just to read his digest is initially funded with a small amount of money. And I felt like I wanted to be pretty smart and fire off some trades in there. Not necessarily well thought out, careful, planned trades, but just some trades to like grow that account while I got around to transferring more money over, which I still haven't done in some cases. But the point is that I'm feeling the pressure in the smaller account to try to do these crazy things just to make the money grow as opposed to just following along the bigger picture plan that I'm doing in the other accounts. So the point is we're all human and we all have these emotions. You just have to be cognizant of them. And as we'll see in a few minutes, in addition to counting to three, there's a few other things you can do 
Just yesterday, I nearly bailed on a trade in that particular account. And today, pre-market, it was up 20%. Why did I bail and not follow the plan? Well, it's like it was a trade. It's kind of outside of things because I didn't have it running in this one particular account. Didn't have it on. Should have been in it. Wasn't. And so I jumped in. And I didn't jump in with the the... I jumped in with a bigger position that I should have in a smaller account, but I also wanted to look smart. I sound like Jackie Mason. So anyway, long story endless, what I'm doing with this account while it's in this transition is not what I should be doing as a proper trader. I should just wait until it's properly funded, trade in my other accounts, or only take the trades that should be taken in this account. Anyway, long story endless, it was up 20%. This morning, so I felt pretty good by not micromanaging, and then today it's actually down. So now there goes another f bomb that I have to be cognizant of. So a year ago, I remembered in this being cognizant thing, I remembered talking with someone, and he's a trader. We were talking about something outside of trading, and then he's like, "Whoa!" And I'm like, "What?" He's like, "What's happening in the currencies?" And initially, I got excited and looked at my charts, and I'm like, "S bomb." <laughs> and he was like, yay, and I'm like, boo. And so this guy be thinking and cognizant that there's other people in the market other than me that might not see things my way. And if you think about it, and I don't remember if it was long or short, but if let's just say I was long, if I bought a currency, somebody had sold it to me. So somebody has the opposite side of that trade. So you want to be cognizant of others and that others have emotions. So this was like a little of a year ago, hence the Chewbacca costume. And I was at this party and this one guy I see maybe once or twice a year. We always end up talking about markets, of course. And he told me, so this was last October or maybe a little earlier. I got out because I thought it was high. And because you know I'm mostly retired, also my youngest is nearing college age. So this is a microcosm of millions of people out there. My question is, what does that have to do with the market? Now, just to back up for a second, why do people sell stocks? People sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Divorce, selling an estate, I'm involved in that one right now. Kids college, I'm involved with that one right now. <laughs> Buying a house, wow, I've just realized this. I'm involved in that one too. And the thing to notice is none of these reasons have anything to do with the underlying company. And a lot of this reasoning comes from Dick Fruth, from Fruth Capital Management. Dick's a good friend of mine. I met him through the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts through Greg Morris. He's running, I don't know the exact amount, but it's at least several hundred million dollars, and he's over in Texas. And when he started out, he started out as a broker where people really didn't trust their brokerages, and people would actually hold the shares in their safe deposit boxes or wherever, and then they would bring them in to sell them when it was time to sell. And the curmudgeons in the office, as Dick pointed out in his book, would just snatch the shares out of their hands and give them their ticket or whatever and send them on their way. Whereas if you know Dick, he's a little more gregarious. He'd sit them down, chat them up a little bit, give them a cup of coffee and say, well, why are you selling the stock? He would get to know the person. And that was his big epiphany early on is that people sold stocks for reasons that had nothing to do with the underlying market. Real quick, as I said before, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship between you and the company. And you're also forming a relationship with anyone who bought the stock prior to you. So you expect the company to do good things and continue to have the shareholders' best interest in, in mind, which they don't always do that. But as a general statement, they do. Most do. But you're also forming a relationship with everyone who's bought the stock prior to you and quoting Tom McClellan and those people will screw you. One reason they'll screw you is because they will sell that stock for a variety of reasons, many of which, as we just saw, have absolutely nothing to do 
with the underlying market. Now, as I mentioned before, when I told Tom, I've been quoting him a lot after I saw him give a presentation at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. I think this one was in New Orleans. He said, I'll do you one better. My late mother, Mary, said, everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are far more sophisticated. So it's safe to say that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, many of which have nothing to do with the underlying company. Now, my whole point in this is by being cognizant of your own emotions, I'm trying to pull it all back. Believe me, I have a point. By being cognizant of your own emotions, you must and can realize, can and must realize that this is a microcosm. You are a microcosm of the market itself. And the market is composed of a bunch of emotional human beings, one of which is you. So I think you can sum this up by saying never forget that you're trading traders and not markets. It's an old adage. One of my favorite things that Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas once said was, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. <laughs> and think about it, could you be the a-hole? Could you be selling for a reason that has nothing to do with your system or whatever, or could it be your system in and of itself that could screw up a perfectly good trade? I learned when I spoke in Vegas a few years back to Traders for a Cause, a charity group, that was composed of mostly day traders, I guess still is, that they do these wild and crazy things like short parabolic stocks. They'll like leverage their account two or three times over whatever they allow you nowadays, five times, I guess, and it's in a purely day trade account with the proper set of properly. Anyway, they'll, they'll just leverage their account and they'll sell these stocks that are going parabolic. Well, that's the same stocks that I'm hopefully in and their selling could knock me out. Their shorting could knock me out. So it made me realize that not only is there somebody on the other side of the trade, there's somebody on the other side of the trade that could be doing the exact opposite. And as Douglas said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And that a-hole could be a trader. It could be an off-the-cuff remark by a CEO ironically, I was given a presentation on this not too long ago, and the day before I gave him a presentation, Elon Musk decides to smoke a joint and drink some whiskey on Joe Rogan, okay? And then Tesla shares tumble afterwards. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a trader. It could be someone outside of the trading world, CEO, or someone else. Could be a tweet <laughs> by someone just last year and just last week, I got emotional about a stock that I'm in because it bounced around a couple of points a day. Now, this is a volatile weed stock, and these weed stocks bounce around a couple of points a day. It's bouncing around as it has been for a long, long time before I got in it. Just because I'm in it doesn't mean it's going to always move in my favor, obviously. So I have to be cognizant of my emotions for getting excited or bummed out, you know, depending on what time of day it is, in a stock that's bouncing around a couple of points that has been bouncing around a couple of points a day for a long, long time. Now, just yesterday, I got pretty emotional. My wife came in my office and she said, it's been two months. Stop everything you're doing. We're going to do your accounting. Great. You know, I'm not too good at running a business from, from that standpoint. I'd rather just do the research and the presentations and the trading as opposed to the accounting. But I know I have to do it if I'm going to keep this educational side of my business up and running. And it is a little self-serving in that, I, of course, I make money from it. But the bigger thing is that it forces me to do the right thing, to recognize when I'm doing the wrong thing, to be cognizant of all of my emotions and so forth. Well, I decided 
wanted to shut down some of the open screen so she could get on the computer. And as I'm shutting down my Forex trade, I realize Forex uh, platform, I realize that I just got stopped out of two of my positions that I've been holding for a while that have been mostly profitable during that holding period. And now I just got stopped out of the loss. So I immediately felt this rush of emotions. And in that process, my wife, phone starts acting up I said do a hard reboot she does it as it comes back up she's getting a text message from my daughter and I kind of smelled the rat and the rat I smelled was that my daughter decided even though I told her if she did this one thing I would cut off her college funding <laughs> and she decided to do it anyway it's kind of a long story but I got quite emotional about that. So did I overreact? Probably. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But one thing that I noticed and felt was probably because the split second I realized that I just got stopped out of something and I was aggravated and emotional about that, a big dose of life came in. And I'm, as I'm putting this together this morning, I was thinking and feeling, being cognizant of my emotions, right? I was thinking how I'm still pretty pissed off at that. And now I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. The crime does not fit, fit the punishment, as I've told stories before about her. <laughs> She's a great kid for the most part. Every now and then, though, as kids will do, they'll test your patience. But the crime doesn't fit the punishment. But now I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. So... I'm kind of wrestling with that a little bit. The point, oh, the point that I came across this morning and being cognizant of all this is that your life will spill over into your trading and vice versa. As I said earlier, it's like aggravated my wife. Hey, look, I'm making money in the market. Now I'm losing money in the market. Today, I'm losing money in the market, but I guarantee you if I was making money today in the market, I could better handle this other stuff that's going on in my life. And now, being cognizant of my emotions, I'm pissed off in my life and I'm pissed off at the markets this morning. So you really have to be cognizant and embrace those emotions. Now, I don't think I've fat fingered a trade lately, but I remember last year, right around this time, I fat fingered a trade. So this goes back to the fact that all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade, and it could be just a simple accident. As Linda Rasky talked about in her book, she had a cat that would get up on her, <laughs> her desk and place trades. And the bad thing about that was she had things set up to where she just had to think in like one unit, okay? So if she's trading a fund with millions of dollars in it, if she thinks to do the calculations, wow, I'm going to be long 100 S&Ps, large or whatever, that's a pretty big trade and all this other stuff. Rather than doing that, she had a little keyboard set up to where one would, would sell 100 or one unit would sell 100 or 150 or whatever number was necessary. So the cat was placed in some pretty big trades. So... The takeaways here are be cognizant of your own emotion, and that's going to give you tons and tons and tons of introspection. Now, I know I beat the dead horse on this, but I'm guilty as charged many times. Are you, are you planning to trade and trading the plan? I, for the most part, work really, really hard to follow that plan, but I am cognizant of my emotions and I find it's a constant struggle to follow what I plan. So unlike these scumbags that make it look like you can make $10,000 every morning before breakfast, I recognize that trading is hard, and I tell you flat out, it's not easy. But in the long run, if you could just force yourself to follow that plan, your life's going to get a lot easier. And by being cognizant of your emotions when you're going against that plan, your life's going to be a lot better, too. The thing that that I'm, like, wrapping my head around lately is, like, if I get stopped out of a trade, 
I forget about it pretty quickly. And I just have to realize that if something's going to stop me out, something's going to make a very negative emotional reaction from me, let it happen and just realize that I'm going to get over that really quickly. I'm going to quickly shout next and move on. But it's when that trade goes to stop out that I find myself getting really, really emotional. And I have to constantly remind myself, just follow the plan, follow the plan, follow the plan. And longer term, it's all going to work out. As I often say, a bad plan followed well is better than a good plan followed poorly. So work, of course you want to work to get better in your stock selection and your market selection and trading when conditions are conducive and all these other things. And that's going to help tremendously. But once you do put that plan in place, just follow the plan. If you could follow the plan as hard as it is, then you've proven, as I say ad nauseum, that you have what it takes to trade. Now, again, be as close to the markets as you need to be. And could you possibly set things up? I'm not saying mechanically, but I'm just saying that you could maybe do a little Showtime Rotisserie 2000, quote, set it and forget it, unquote. And my, for instance, there from three or four slides back was – I was watching the screen, waiting for that profit target to get hit. And I said, you know what? You have more important things to do than sit there and watch that stupid screen all day. And what does Dave say about watching the screen? It's going to get you into a lot of trouble. Sakota once said, what did he say? Having a, a quote machine in your desk is like having a slot machine. You're going to want to feed it. So instead of doing that, what was the Ron Popeil thing? Well, I put in an order to take those partial profits when it was hit. Now, I just showed you how I got a little emotional before, doing and after that exercise. But the bottom line was, if I would have just turned my screens off, I could have let the chips fall where they may, and I would have followed the plan. Well, I followed the plan, but in the meantime, I had a lot of emotional ups and downs, a lot of unnecessary emotional ups and downs. So as I often preach, one of the simplest things you can do and I know there's a little discretion around a lot of this stuff, too. So that's that's a little bit more advanced. And I know that might seem like talking out of both sides of my mouth. But in 90 to I'd say 95 percent or even more. Of the cases, you can do a lot of things to let the market make decisions for you. You can actually put a stop in place. So that position will go against you, but you'll also get out of it before it gets worse. As I preach. It's often darkest right before it gets more dark. So let that market make some decisions for you. Release yourself from those emotions, from those emotions of watching every zig and zag, from the emotions of negative observations, which more often than not, what Robert Frey talked about, you will have. You will, be, you will put yourself into a constant state of regret. And you can see that it's a bit of a downward start, spiral. I know I'm being really negative in this, but there is some positive takeaways. If you are making all those observations by chance, more often than not, they're going to be negative observations. And on top of that, a negative observation is going to be twice as emotional for you as a positive observation. So you can see really quickly, this is a dangerous downward spiral you can easily get into. So at the risk of beating a dead horse, watch the screen as little as you have to be, be as close to the markets as you have to be, but no closer, and then use some orders that will let the market make some decisions for you. If the market opens up and there's no discretion that needs to be done, your stop's pretty far away, put a hard stop in, okay? If a stock is bouncing around, can't quite seem to get to that profit target, and it's still a little ways away, then put a limit order in to take those partial profits. And again, just remember that the markets are imperfect. Your system is imperfect. And so are you. If you found the Holy Grail, well, you'd make a lot of money, right? Well, it doesn't exist. If it does exist, then soon you would own the markets or soon that edge would come out of the markets. It would no longer exist. And somebody else probably would have found it too. I, I, I'm not going to throw anybody in the bus, but 
I know there's been some methods where people have literally thrown millions of dollars at these, I hate to say it, but counting methods, so to speak, and they all that money went down the drain. There is no holy grail. Now, again, you have to, as I said at Market Wizards, and this is one of my favorite quotes ever, separate trade intuition from into wishing. And I think that's a Jimmy Rogers quote. And then, as I often preach, do the postmortem and come back to the fact that did you make the did you do the right thing to begin with? Did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Now, a few more closing thoughts on being cognizant. A lot of stress in life and trading comes from not knowing what to do. One of my salvations in all this, and I think this originally came from Anthony Robbins, is if you don't know what to do, this is what I would do. So just say, I don't know what to do, but if I did know what to do, this is what I would do. And I learned that early on in my trading career when I was hired by a hedge fund to do their technical analysis. And there were times where I felt like, okay, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but if I knew what was going to happen, what would that be? And I'd say, well, it looks like the market's in a trend. I think it's going higher. And the person who hired me, at one point I said, would you mind giving me a reference? And he said, no problem. It was another fund that, that needed some work outside of the market that we were in. And he was okay with me doing that. Anyway, long story endless, I'm like, what did you tell him? I was like, well, you know, in so many words, he basically told this other guy that I was often wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> so when I didn't know what to do, I told myself, if I, but if I did know what to do, this is what I would do. So when you get into a trade, if you ever find yourself that deer in the head like beginning to panic a little bit, and you feel these emotions coming on, you're cognizant of these emotions, then just tell yourself, I don't know what to do, but if I did know what to do, this is what I would do, okay? This morning, I have a position going against me. I found myself going, oh, uh, I don't know what to do. But if I did know what to do, well, I do know what to do. I need to put a stop in, and I need to get about get on with my life. So that's going to help you tremendously. Real quick, I know I say this every week, but I think this week is the week I'm launching the learning management system. Pretty excited about it. I know I'm a nerd, but it's going to be pretty cool. And in this system, I'm going to have, or I do have, I should say, these trading courses, which has been parsed out. This is the learning management system. The reason it's a learning management system is, as you'll see in the first couple of intro, intro videos on this, when I was researching online education, I learned that there's an abysmal completion rate. I'd say 90, I think it was 90 something percent of all of online courses are never finished. And the reason, or one of the main reasons is we're all busy, okay? That's one reason. And it's not put into small, easy to digest chunks, and it's also not measurable. So in case I get hit by a beer truck, I'm laying it all out in this thing. And also, we can measure progress. And this is going to be a biggie. I've had clients that I've worked with for a long, long time, and they're not setting their stops properly. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with this person? Well, now I can come in here and say, wait a minute. You're just barely started on the micro, on the money, on the micro management, on the money management course. You might need to focus your energies there. You're having a lot of psychological problems and you're trading. Well, we all do. Congratulations. Welcome to trading. Maybe you need to spend some more time over here in trading psychology and finish up this course. Anyway, I'll be able to track the progress and see what's going on, as will you. And this is what your dashboard in the courses will look like. You'll be able to see what you have left and where you are. 
Anyway, I'm a real nerd. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A session every couple of weeks. Because I really think everything is in here, but I keep adding content every day, literally. And that's why it's taking me so long to launch this thing. But keep an eye out for that. should be out soon. I'm adding a lot of little features like emergency 911 calls. I'll give you my number where you can call me. And you can earn these calls over time and lots of other things like consulting and so forth by staying a member and plenty, plenty of uh, bonuses and stuff. First three weeks or so, I'll give you all three books and then the courses come shortly thereafter. All right. Any questions on anything we've done so far? Mark in the Brexit lounge. What's the Brexit lounge? You haven't seen any charts, you should. According to my screen, nope. Maybe um, maybe log out, log back in. On my side, it's showing that it's uh, it's showing them. Okay. All right. Well, let me pull up the actual charts. And let's go through a few things there. Anybody, is everybody seeing the S&P 500? According to my screens, you should be seeing the S&P 500. Yes, okay, Donald's seeing. Okay, Steve, your charts, um, sometimes, a, sometimes a squirrel will be moving his nuts and get him caught in wires or something in between me and you. Yeah, maybe reboot or something. I don't know. All right, let's start with the P's. And then I want to drill down to a few sectors. First and foremost, as I've been preaching, when a market is at or near all-time highs, give the benefit of the doubt. Okay, with that said, there's plenty to worry about. So if we go here, first of all, even with today's spill, let's not get too excited. We're about a percent away from all-time highs. So as long as we remain at or near. Now, what is at or near? Well, 10% is a little system that I talked about a while back, and that seems to be a good round number. Now, it doesn't mean that you should hold on to your stocks until the market is down 10%. What I'm saying is you obviously want to use stops, and you'll probably get stopped out of most of your stocks long before the market is down 10%. But what I'm saying is, you want to be mostly long or looking to get long when the market is at or near its old highs, within 10% of its old highs. And you want to consider selling or being short the market when it is more than 10% away from its old highs. Now, let's – um, oops. Um, an hourly chart by accident. Maybe that's a Freudian – Fat finger there, but let's let's take a look at the hourly just for SGs. One thing I've talked about before, and this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier when I was talking about forex trading. One thing I like to do is look for bow ties on the hourly after major major new highs. So let's see what we have here in the P's. It didn't bow tie here; it's kind of sloppy, but now it looks like it could bow tie on the hourly. So for the trader types, not a huge fan of trading the S and P other than like an ogre trade, but for the trader types, maybe you might want to consider shorting for a short-term trade on the bow tie. If memory serves way back here, we had an hourly bow tie at this peak. But I got to be careful not to look too far into the minutia and just for now say we're not too far from all-time highs. This is a weekly chart. So far, well, hang on. This is a weekly chart. <laughs> so far, the bow ties remain in proper uptrend order, and they also remain in proper uptrend order, meaning the 10 simples greater than 20 exponential and 20 exponentials greater than 30 exponential longer term. Okay, longer term proper uptrend order. Now, over the short to intermediate term, we got a little bit of problem. Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Okay. We've got a little sideways action in here. It's also October, let's not forget. But since August, and we could probably adjust this back a day or two, let's go back to August 28th. Where was the market on August 28th, 2900? Where are we today? 
2,900. So that's what, one month, almost two months? No, nah, it's 929, yeah, a month and change, okay? Sideways action. So that's a little bit concerning, but again, longer term, trend still up. Nothing to get excited about just yet. My gut earlier in our late summer, early fall, was that we'd see the mother of all shakeouts and then the longer term uptrend would resume, something kind of along the lines of a trend knockout. And thinking that and knowing that and then actually living through it is two different things, okay? Uh, after all is said and done, we might just look back and say, well, it was just a little bit of a shakeout move, everything's fine. But living through it is pretty scary. Today's accident in NASDAQ, pretty darn ugly, okay? We're still, we're a percent and a half further away than we were yesterday, but we're still not that far away from all-time highs. And so far, the big blue arrow is still pointing higher. But as my accountant tells me, my tax accountant says, you can't stick your head in the sand, okay? You got to deal with these issues, okay? And he's right. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. This is what I've been a little bummed out about, a little concerned about, is that the Russell 2000, when it broke out, it didn't really break out with much vigor, then it starts rolling right back over. We take a look at the bow ties, and they're a little sloppy, but as you can see, this is a daily chart. They're now in downtrend proper order. And technically today, as I speak, it is triggering a bow tie sell signal off of all-time highs on a daily chart for those keeping score. That is not a good thing. It's not the end of the world. Let's not get too excited. But, hey, let's just pay attention. Just for S&Gs, let's take a look at an hourly chart. I have not looked at this before, so I don't know what I'm going to see. But I had a feeling you can see, look, an hourly bow tie down off of all-time highs. Okay, that's usually where a trend begins on the hourly chart after all-time highs. And then the daily and then the weekly. Now, let's take a look at a weekly. Speaking of weekly, so far, bigger picture, weekly doesn't look quite as bad. These moving averages are still in uptrend proper order. Notice the 20 exponential has turned down. 20 week exponential has turned down. It turned down after one day of trading. Why? Well, because price crossed below it. I learned that from Greg Morris. The day the price crosses below an exponential moving average, it will turn down. Take a look at what happened back here. Of course, a simple turn too, so that's not a great example. But any day that the price crosses below the moving average, let me see if I can find you one where the the daily still up. It will turn down. No, I don't have a good example here. I've got a lot of good examples on the back end of the website. But anyway, long story endless. You can see anytime it goes below, it turns down. This is why the bow ties catch up the price a little quicker because we're using two exponential moving averages, which are front weighted, and that helps tremendously. Now, speaking of something to worry about, Take a look at bonds. Bonds are pretty ugly. That's a weekly chart. Take a look at the daily bonds, and it looks even uglier. As you can see, break it down here and down another a little bit more than three-quarters of a percent today. That's pretty ugly. What's scary is, and this is what I've been preaching, if we start taking out the multi-year lows, then we might have a problem. And what are we doing now? This is a weekly chart. We're taking out these multi-year lows with vigor. Ideally, we'd like to see this market pop right back up to make all that do-over. So that's a little bit of concern. Now, so Dave, I just sell stocks when bond goes down. When bonds go down, well, it's not quite that easy. As I often preach, read uh, Intermarket Technical Analysis by John Murphy. And then realized, as Murphy himself says, there's long lead and lag times. There's been times throughout history, and I seem to remember early in my career, late 80s, early 90s, where you pretty much could trade stocks off bonds. Now it only matters when it matters. So this could be a shot across the bow with interest rates and could spook some people. and could cause or trigger or be the catalyst, however you want to look at it, choose your favorite word to creating some longer-term asset allocation or trigger some asset allocation models. 
So obviously bonds down, yields up. I noticed somebody was talking about the 10 year yield today. I'm in a professional form. I, I don't read too much, but every now and then when the market goes a little nuts, I'll take a peek. And I noticed that somebody in there was talking about bonds and specifically the yields on the 10 years using a TNX, okay? TNX dash dash X, you can see breaking out to new highs. So this means that this is interest rates rising on the 10 year. Now I don't do a lot of yield curve studies because I think that's another one of those things where you could go down a rabbit hole and get yourself in a lot of trouble. And it only matters what it matters. But I know some people much smarter than me have some concerns about the yield curve inverting. So you might want to take a look at the yield curve. Just don't try to connect all the dots, okay? My problem with something like that is if you can't directly trade off of it, then toss it out. Well, with bonds going down and rates going up, you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Not that you want to build a model around all these things, but just have it in the back of your mind that it scores as a negative. As I often say, you're putting the pieces of the puzzle together and that scores obviously as a negative piece. But again, it only matters when, when it matters. Let's take a look at some of these sectors in here. Well, the energies are doing pretty good. Nice persistent move higher. They're just beginning to break out of this longer term range. Ideally, you know me, I like to see them clear the prior peak in here decisively, which I haven't done just yet. And now they're getting hit a little bit this morning too. And keep in mind that you know, energy is kind of a mixed bag. If energies are going up, that's a good thing and it helps the market go higher. But if energies are going down, that's a bad thing because they're part of the indices and they pull the indices down with them. If energies are going up, that could also be a bad thing because it means that oil prices are probably rising, which they are. I know I just talked out of both sides of my mouth. The point is don't try to connect all those dots. Just pay attention to everything. This is USO. I like to use it as a proxy for oil. But you could use whatever you want, regardless of what you're using. All prices are going higher. You know, I don't want to digress too far. I know, too late. But uh, in looking at this USO this morning, I was thinking I did a presentation a while back based on one of my columns or inspired by one of my own columns where I talked a lot about human nature. And today we talked a lot about human nature, including our own, our own emotional nature. And I did the whole presentation. And like the day before I did the presentation, a neighbor stopped by and he said that he was shorting oil. Or he was already short oil because it was high. And that was months and months and months ago. Well, we could see what oil has done since. So here's someone who's a man on the street microcosm of what is out there just because it was high. Anyway. Long story, endless on that. But the point is, made up of a lot of people, and their decisions have nothing to do with the overall market. Retail, in a nice longer term uptrend, but I'm beginning to get a little concern in here, okay? Notice that both type moving averages are turning down. Why? Well, because price crossed below them, okay? The simple takes a little while to turn, which is this blue line in here, but now it has begun to turn down too. So we'll have to pay attention to what's going on there. Transports recently broke out, came back in, sort of sideways at best as of late. Let's back the chart out a little bit. They still really haven't taken out the prior peak in here decisively. So that's something to kind of think about. Okay. Now, again, when you're at or near new highs, give the market the benefit of the doubt. And all it would take would be a few big updates. In a lot of these markets, and we'd be back to new highs, and we may have dodged a bullet. But right now, as I speak, things are looking a little uglier than they have been. I'm a huge fan of having the semiconductors go higher. I I would prefer, and if memory serves, I think there were some systems done on this way back in the trading markets days by somebody that was part of trading markets. I don't know if it was Larry Connors or somebody else on the site. But instead of using the transports, they were using the semiconductors. And part of the reasoning there, and I may be getting my stories mixed up, but somebody pointed out that the semiconductors are like the new transport because everything is done electronically and such. And I guess you would throw Internet in there, too, as opposed to 
the old school transport. Well, you know, be careful with all these things like Dow theory and all, but as transports have become less important, now they're becoming more important again because obviously a lot of goods are being shipped from online transactions and such. Anyway, long story endless, my point is that I do believe that it's important or it's certainly beneficial and doesn't hurt when the semiconductors confirm what you're seeing in the overall market. And now semiconductors have been all over the place and sideways, except for AMD for the most part. And now they're beginning to break down a little bit as of today. It's not the end of the world. We take out the bottom of this range, though. I would become concerned. The point I'm trying to make is things are kind of hanging in there overall, but now we have some reasons to be concerned. Some areas like the fence just broke out to new highs, so that certainly scores a positive coming back in a little, little bit today like everything else. Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. Let's take a look at banks real quick. Banks had a big bounce when bonds began to drop, and now they're looking a little iffy once again, too. Banks seem to do better when rates are going up as a general statement. But they're getting a little iffy in here. So just be real selective uh, in as far as opportunities. The, most of the opportunities I'm seeing are in super speculative stocks. And I've got a, a chart on this somewhere. I'll have to see if I could dig it out or maybe I just drew it in. But what happens sometimes is even if the market gets iffy, your speculative stocks, especially something like IPOs, have a bit of like a last gas higher. And what happens is they're not... They're not held hostage, at least initially, by the overall market. So this is something I talked a lot about when I did the IPO stuff. And the sometimes the market will start doing this. This is the market. And then your speculative stocks will do this and then have a bit of a delayed tanking in here, okay? So I'm still seeing a few opportunities. I have three potential longs coming into today that I talked about last night in the service, and I'm looking to buy, even though the market's a little iffy today. Well, the good news is so far, at least I don't think so, they, they haven't triggered. Okay. Let's open it up for individual stock questions and all questions in general. Okay. The question is, our statement a net short bow tie on daily from all time highs. Hourly B bow tied a week ago. Okay, A net. Let's take a look at A net. And let's see. Well, this would not be a stock I would trade because it tends to be all over the place. Now, it had some nice trends back here. But you have these certain stocks that tend to be held. I don't know if it's they're held hostage to the earnings or news or whatever. But it's just headed, just going straight up, and then just absolutely whacked. And then look at that rinse and repeat. Now, if I had to be long or short this stock, I would be short this stock. I hear you, okay? But it's such a wild, and it has no structure in that. It has these huge big gap moves in it every now and then. So you're saying it bow tied on the daily. It did. Okay. I guess your entry would have been somewhere in here. And then you set on an hourly. Let's take a look at that real quick. Well, by the time it bow tied, it had already imploded. And you have to realize sometimes moving averages will have so much lag in them, you have to use other patterns to get in, okay? So I would personally pass on this one. But yeah, if you're short, stay short. Just have a stop in mind. You rove, okay? It looks like we've got a bad tick in there. Let's see if we can get that tick out. Um, I don't know if we can. Well, it's going to be hard for me to visualize this one. Let me go to another screen. Hang on one second. Okay, yeah, it's had a pretty good run in here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see if we could put in a moving average. And let me go and see, as you just, you can't see, but you probably 
like I said, I had to walk over to another screen. It forces me to physically get up and went over to my trading station to and walk a couple steps to actually make a trade. Yeah, if this thing closes at new highs, this might be worth going after. One thing I am seeing, though, a little bit on the thin side, uh, but not too bad. It's got some volume in here. But, yeah, a new closing high on this, I think it might be worth a shot if you're looking to play the IPO, five-day IPO, little Dave Light system that we talk about quite often. BVX. Okay. Another IPO, right? Or no? No, this is this is an established issue. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, super duper thin, though. Look at the, it's uh, what 160,000 shares on average. So yeah, I think it looks okay. Who's that, Donald? Um, a little extended in here, but it certainly looks okay. Just make sure you wait for an entry on that one, but it's not bad. It's got a little TKO type of move within the pullback. Quite a few days of the pullback, though. If it doesn't trigger, I would definitely bail or stop looking at it, I should say. So that's not bad. MRNS. Keep them coming. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, there's a couple of things, though. Let's, let's take a look at some things. Uh, longer term, kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And longer term, it really never did get past this prior little peak in here. I think I would look for something that's a little bit more cleaner in its trading. Although I get you. I hear what you're saying. It's been pretty clean lately. And then the other thing I'm seeing on a micro basis is sometimes you get a whack like this, which is kind of TKO-like type of setup, type of knockout. It's a good thing. But when the market begins to kind of crawl up afterwards, I begin to question it. Sometimes you get a little crawl up and then it dies. Just keep an eye on that. See what happens longer term. The other thing, too, is it didn't really break out too much past this prior peak before coming back in. So I would, I would pass based on all of that stuff. Uh, Donald, that other one you're talking about is my favorite, absolute favorite stock today. I have an order in to buy it. And I think I'm going to give you a high five. I can't mention it, though, right away because out of courtesy of the people in the service. But I'll mention it next week. Be happy to. Bring it up next week. Let's see what happens. It's not a, it's not a weed stock, but the symbol makes it sound like it is. <laughs> There's a little hint. Um, this one is interesting. It's just had such an incredible run longer term. Don't get me wrong. I'm a huge fan of momentum. But when a stock has gone this long and this far, you have to begin to wonder if it's price for perfection. But Dave, I thought you were a trend follower. Okay, I am. But the point is that if you go back to a lot of the stuff that I've done on efficiency and more specifically inefficiency, when I should, let me just rewind a little bit. Efficiency and inefficiency tends to wax and wane. And tends to change over time. So this stock is still moving in a very inefficient manner. But now that the volume has gotten so high in it, what's going to happen is you're, well, obviously you're getting more and more participants. And, they'll, and they will begin to cancel each other out. Okay. So that's one concern that I would have. The other concern is we just broke out the top of this little peak here. And now we're almost back into it. And the other thing is I'd actually like a little bit deeper pullback, but that would put us back into this peak. So I'm actually going to pass. As good as this stock looks longer term, I'm going to pass for those reasons. Now, I want to keep it technical in nature because my trading is 100% technical. And based on that technical reason, it has pulled back to nearly where it broke out. And then, I, again, I'd like to see some more pullback, but then that would put it further below this breakout level. So that would negate the setup. So the reason I point, pointed out inefficiency, efficiency, and the fact that the stock has become more, uh, has more trading volume and likely will become more efficient is that it's possibly priced for perfection. Now, but Dave, I thought you said, let's just focus on the technicals. Well, I am, but I want the technicals to be even better for those aforementioned reasons. And in picking it apart, it's like it doesn't work technically. Now, if you're long or still long, 
didn't stay long. You thought SQ was a short? No. Well, that's the danger too. I mean, you know, you don't want to short a market that looks like that. I mean, if you're one of those crazy day traders who likes to short things that go up, I guess I got to be careful because I got some nasty grams for some crazy day traders. <laughs> Not that you're crazy, it's just some of the things you do or can be a lot more riskier than you might realize, okay? I know some successful day traders, and God bless them, but they're kind of all over the place, and you can't live like that for long, and that's another lesson that I've given many times before. But no, I would not short this stock. I think it'd be way too dangerous to short. And just for S and Gs, let's just see what's happening on a hourly basis. And please do not run out and short this stock. But yeah, on an hourly basis, you could have an hourly bow tie soon. That would be the mother of all dangerous trades. But if it does top, it would top first with an hourly thing. SPY, hourly bow tie from high possible today. All right, let's take a look at that. That's interesting. That's a good piece of information. So there's the spiders. Let's take a look at an hourly chart. I'm not sure why I said early. There's a one hour chart. Yeah, um, but I think it already bow tied from highs, sort of. It's sort of bow tied. Yeah, it was kind of sloppy, but it's sort of bow tied back here. Your hourly bow tie would have been like right in here somewhere. But I hear what you're saying. It's kind of like a second mouse type of signal. It, it, shaw, it stalled short of its prior highs, and then now it's making a bow tie down again. Um, this is kind of what I call a forced bow tie, though. It's it's the, when the market slides fast like this, it forces those moving averages to to cross over. So yeah, on a bounce on an hourly chart, it would be a short. Um, I'm a little against or a lot against pure short term trading, although I do do it, admittedly, in the forex. And the reason is that bad things can still happen. And I know a lot of short-term traders make a lot of money, and then they have huge losses, and, they, and then they go back to chipping it away, chipping away at it. I think I mentioned this recently, but and Linda and I have gone back and forth a little bit on this, and she's more of a pure short-term trader than I am, and and she had an interesting way of kind of I don't know if diffusing me is the right word, but kind of making me really think about it, and it's true. And and she said the. Short-term versus long-term dilemma is God's way of handing a trader a card with overprinted on both sides, okay? And that, I thought, was pretty astute of her. Nerve. What are you saying? I have nerve. Oh, NERV to stock. All right, let's take a look at that. Let's back this out a little bit. Okay, another case where ideally, I know it's, it's, no, it's years and years ago, but ideally... When you're in these longer term established trends, as opposed to trading stuff like a, like a transition. Now, a transition would be back here coming off of major lows. That's a different type of trading. Once you're in trend resumption mode, in other words, trading pullbacks and such, or pullback like patterns, I really like a market to be taken out its prior highs. Now, with all that said, it's not bad, okay? I can't really pick it apart too much. Although it's kind of thin, okay, so just be warned on that. You have a little bit of acceleration happening, okay, on top of the base breakout. So it's not bad. It's not a bad-looking stock, okay? I wouldn't quite give you a high five on that, but it's certainly not a bad-looking stock. Certainly a good eye on that. All right, any more? My stomach just growled. I wonder if that got picked up on the. Uh... <laughs> uh. All right. While we're in impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am, as I said earlier, flattered and humbled by your presence. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry .com. Keep an eye out for that learning management system. It's going to be a nominal charge for that, but I think it's going to be phenomenal. I'm excited about being able to help you guys. We'll be able to figure out what you're doing wrong. And then longer term, I have some bigger picture things planned. Like I think from this, we could graduate you guys into maybe like a trader tribe. 
And I'm just, I'm a nerd, but I'm really excited about that. And I really think that these, there's big things coming. But let's get through this. Let's get the system launched first and work through the uh, information to go from there. You're welcome. All right, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Again, thanks, everybody, for coming. And any unanswered questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. And once again, keep an eye out for the learning management system. Lots of exciting things going on there. Thank you, everybody.